Major's Mask. Chapter 32. Snowhead. Link lay there dazed. He couldn't see anything, and the chilly white tomb completely encased him. The commotion had ended, and for a moment, he could not fight for freedom. There was no energy left. The exhaustion paralyzed him. On this day, he'd ventured through the dark cave connecting Termina to the wasteland. The day before, he had battled the Dongos, fled from an entire nest of tektites, almost froze to death in the snow, and lost his only friend to a cloaked, re-dead creature. Two days before that, Anju had died, and the entire village of Clocktown had rallied against him. He'd remembered that Zelda was dead, and that he had no one left in Hyrule. The battles and the emotional turmoil at that moment were suffocating. The woes of a lifetime hit him all at once. Then he balled his fist, and snow squished between his fingers, he searched for his will to keep going, and then clawed his way to freedom. He rose from the snow, turning to see Tail floating where his head popped out. The fairy's face immediately relaxed. Darmani's already white sideburns were now speckled with ice, too. He pulled the rest of himself from the snow to see Gorbis doing the same beside him. You're okay? Tail asked. <sighs> yeah. Link said, brushing himself off and shivering. The snow was up to his knees now. The rest of this trek is going to be painful, he realized. Are you okay? He asked the Goron beside him, who still seemed shocked. Gorbis's hand was up against the wall, and he leaned over, out of breath and shaking. When his eyes found Armani, he appeared torn between fleeing and giving him a chance. Yes, but you... Aren't... I'm not really Darmani, Link said. How do you wear his face, then? Gorbis asked. Darmani's ghost came to me. He asked me to bring him back to life, but I couldn't. The only thing I knew how to do was heal him. I helped him move on, and it left behind this mask. The Goron kept watching him uncertainly. Maybe I shouldn't have been 100% honest, Link thought. He remembered the people of Clocktown who had formed an angry mob, and he imagined them with Goron faces. How did you do that? My ocarina, Link said. No, Tail interrupted. The Masked Salesman's song. Link shot Tail an angry glance, but Gorbis only looked at the two with a wrinkled brow. I don't know who this mask salesman is, or how he helps you turn spirits into masks, but you saved me. Link's demeanor calmed. The pitchforks and torches faded from his mind. You told me in the village that you would break Snowhead of its curse, though your magic is strange. He paused as if the words to come were difficult to say. I want to trust you. Maybe now that I have nothing left... It is easier to trust something strange, but I want to believe that all hope is not lost. Link allowed the words to sink in. As the fear left Gorbis's eyes, his deep sadness returned. A sadness that I can relate to, the hero thought. Yet, he'd brought Gorbis hope. Why did you come this way? Link asked. Gorbis looked away shamefully. It's so painful to sit here, do nothing, and think of him. His mouth quivered, but tears didn't come. The gods already decided death in the valley was not for me, so I decided I would go to Snowhead, as you said you would. Either I saved my village, or I get what I wanted to begin with. Link placed a hand on the Goron's shoulder. You don't have to do this. I'm supposed to do this, Darmani and I. We can end this curse and give you a reason to live again. You should go back to the village and help your people there, where they need you, if not for them, or yourself, then for your son. 
Gorvis never broke eye contact and eventually nodded. Thank you. You may not be the Goron hero whose face you wear, but you are a hero. Link smiled, and the Goron went to leave. We're even now, Link said. The Goron paused to look back. You saved me, and I saved you. Now I just have to pay Darmani back by saving your village. The Goron gave him a weak smile before turning away and beginning his trek to Goron Village. Link watched as he disappeared into the thick snow. Then, the trek to Snowhead continued. The deep snow made the mountain pathway even more treacherous, especially since the blizzard hadn't abated. Rolling into a ball would make it easier to see, but then the snow would be taller than him. He could only press on, hoping the temple would eventually come into view. Link broke his and Tail's silence a few minutes into their journey. What was that about? He asked in the dead Goron hero's voice. What? When I was explaining everything to him, what do you have against the masked salesman? It's just a song, and a song of healing. I don't trust him, that's all. I understand that, but why? Weren't you the one that robbed him? No, the Skull Kid did. I told you that. Why do you trust him? He helped me. Link said. The snow was starting to sting even his Goron skin again. I would have died. I fell off the clock tower, and he healed my wounds with that song. Why did he save you? I don't... Link realized he didn't have an answer. Did he save you out of the goodness of his heart? I'm not sure, Link admitted, remembering their conversation underneath the tower. He promised to heal me with my ocarina if I got him back Majora's mask, but he did it before he checked to see if I had it, and he got pretty angry once he realized his mistake. I don't trust anyone who wants that mask, Tail said. How different would things be if he had put it on instead of the Skull Kid? He knows what the mask is, Link said. The Skull Kid doesn't. The mask salesman knows better than to wear it. Why does he want it, then? Because of all the terrible things it's doing, he said, growing slightly irritated. He wants to stop it. He told me I needed to bring it back to him before it got too awful. He told me that I had to choose between the light and the dark, and that I had to stop it. The light and the dark? I don't know what he meant by that, but he knows more than he lets on. He knew that Tattle and I had gone back in time. Tail's eyes narrowed. Then shouldn't he have known you didn't have Majora's Mask when he healed you? That thought had never occurred to Link. Maybe his knowledge has limits. Or he lied. Look, he saved my life, Link said firmly. There is something really mysterious about him, but that doesn't mean he's bent on world domination. Tail didn't have a response. He let the quiet linger for a moment longer. Did he teach you the Song of Time, too? No, Link said. That one's from Hyrule. How many times have you played it? Link furrowed his brow, thinking deeply. He had played it for the first time on accident, when Tattle died. The second time was after the first day to show the new Tattle the truth. Then he had spent yet another one in Clocktown to confront the Skull Kid again. After that, Woodfall? He'd spent the cycle after that recuperating, followed by the Skull Kid's siege on Clocktown, and another day of recovery. Six? Six, Link said, never having tallied it before. I think I've played the Song of Time six times. This is my seventh loop. So this is your twentieth day? No, Link answered. I didn't use all three days every time. Something else, however, continued bugging his mind. Had the moon fallen six times? He wouldn't be able to stop the moon from falling this time either. The seventh. Do you think the world ends each time? Tail asked, as if reading his mind. That's something Tattle and I talked about a lot. I guess there's no way for us to know. We just have to keep going like that's not what happens. Tail didn't respond. 
I guess I wouldn't either, Link thought. It was easy for him and Tattle to pretend the world would end each time when they were guaranteed to survive. The six previous tales, however, weren't as lucky. Soon the pathway widened into an abrupt end. Through the thick snow, Tail and Link saw the dead end drop off into the mountain's ever-present chasm. A new path began on the other side of the lengthy gap. A wooden ramp rested on each end of the hole. There was no way to cross other than to leap over the gap. I guess this is a Goron jump, Link said. I think your legs are too small to make that jump, Tail said. Link took a step back anyways, examining his surroundings. Tail, in case this doesn't work, it was nice knowing you. What? The purple fairy said, watching Link step further back from the ramp. He dragged his feet through the snow to clear away a path. I don't see how that's gonna help. Link decided to respond through demonstration again. He rolled into a ball and traveled as fast as he could toward the gap. Whoa! Tail exclaimed, quickly flying after him in a panic. Link, stop! This is stupid! He took no heed. Link rolled through the path he'd created to reach the ramp at high speed. Then he was in midair, spinning as he descended to the other side. He barely made the lip of the opposite ramp, his momentum carrying him through several feet of snow before he stopped. Link stood tall as a clearly strained tail joined him. You idiot! Tail yelled. Link's smile vanished, taken back by the fairy's anger. You could have gotten us both killed! Both? Tail's eyes widened, as if he'd said something he hadn't meant to. He shook his head. You just have me worried, that's all. Don't do anything stupid like that again. Link almost came up with a witty retort, but he reminded himself that this wasn't Tattle. Even though it was very Tattle-like of him to yell at me like that. He wondered what their parents had been like for the first time. We don't have much time left. If we're going to make it to Snowhead and save Tattle... We need to make decisions quickly. Link then walked off. Tail took a moment before deciding to follow. Eventually, something other than mountain wall, gray sky, or snow appeared on the horizon. Link rounded the next corner, noting the strange noise ahead. It was a sharp whistling that was loud enough to almost be a roar. The sound became louder with each step, and soon the new area presented itself. Link looked in awe, glancing at the frozen sign beside him. Snowhead Temple. High winds ahead. Gusts and snow flurries may blow careless travelers off the cliffs. Huh. The mountain wall on their left had ended. A new thin pathway of ice snaked over the same deadly chasm, and like before, there was no railing. But unlike last time, both sides threatened a deadly plummet. The pathway went on for a while, eventually reaching a thick column that stood in the chasm's middle. The column, however, was not a small cave or an empty space like the previous ones. Instead, a ridiculously sized chunk of ice and rock rested on it. The temple. The powerful structure towered high, and a thin ramp ran around from the bottom to top. Spikes acted as a crown at the peak, and nothing in the vicinity challenged its height or magnificence. The perilous pathways leading up to it completed the picture. It was as deadly as it was beautiful. The loud noise repeated itself, and Lincoln Tail noticed a visible blast of cold air bellowing over the temple road. It seemed to come from the temple, mercilessly blowing over the bridge. After a few moments, it stopped, though it always quickly reappeared. There's no way to cross that in between the breaks, Link thought. That blast of air would blow even Darmani away. Link stood there in awe, his wide black Goron eyes taking it in. We're here, Link said eventually. Was it worth it? He wondered. Of all the cycles, this one had seemed the longest. At its start, he was still brimming with optimism about what lay across Termina's borders. Tattle was still by his side, and the only goal in their minds was freeing the giant. Neither of them had heard of the re-dead faced creature. It looks dangerous, Tail said, just as awestruck. Yeah. 
For the first time in a while, he realized how heavy his eyes were. I haven't slept since right before I met Tail. That had been almost a full 24 hours ago. But I think it's almost midnight, which means we only have 30 hours left. We need to go inside. Now. But that wind, Tail said. Even if you rolled as fast as you did earlier, you still wouldn't make it in time, and you'd probably roll off the edge anyways. The bridge is so thin. I know, Link said. He watched the random gusts of wind again. They seemed separate from the storm. Where are they coming from? I don't know. Tail squinted his eyes as if searching for something. Invisible. Link realized. He removed his Goron mask, anticipating how much more intense the cold would get. Shivering, his hand found the lens of truth. It revealed the largest Goron Link had ever seen. The mountain dweller was sitting comfortably on the bridge's other side, almost as big as the temple at his back. The rock creature would take in a deep breath and then exhale the dangerous gust of wind over the pathway. Once it ran out of breath, the big Goron paused catching his breath before leaning forward, inhaling, and blowing again. What? Tail said, flying to see for himself. It's... I know, Link said, putting the instrument away. Even if an arrow could cut through all that wind, he knew his bow couldn't damage such a massive creature. Link didn't own anything else long-ranged. And even if I could roll across in time, the Bigoron wouldn't let me pass. It would be an impossible battle. He would only have this tiny ledge, and such a massive creature would squash him. I think this is where Darmani died. I bet, Tail said. There has to be a way. I mean, I could fly in, but the goal is to bring you too. We've got to have something that could fight it, Link said. Something... Worlds are pretty tough to begin with, but this one... Everything has a weakness. Not that thing. Did the mask salesman teach you a stop Gorons from existing song too? No, Link said, stopping when an idea presented itself. But... But what? We do know one song that works on Gorons. Link turned to Tail, smiling. The purple fairy connected the dots. You want to try and put him to sleep? Link shrugged. I know it sounds crazy, but it's the only idea I have. He pulled the ocarina out of his belt and put it to his lips, steadying himself from shivering before he played the song. Quickly, it came to him, despite learning it on drums. As the Goron lullaby filled the valley, the Bigoron became visible without the lens of truth. Its eyes quickly became heavy, and the Goron leaned forward into the song, no longer capable of concentrating on his breathing. The ocarina's voice soared high, and Link allowed his natural talent as a musician to save them. The strong, icy breaths never turned. Link continued looping the melody until it had taken complete control of the massive creature. One heavy blink became its last, and then it curled into a ball. The guardian slowly rolled over to the side, eventually toppling over the edge and plummeting into the deep chasm that had claimed Darmani. Link lowered his ocarina, somewhat stunned that it had worked. Whoa, Tail commented. The bridge was now clear, obstructed only by normal snowfall. Link smiled, turning into Darmani and walking carefully over the thin bridge. Tail followed closely, and the temple grew taller with each step, casting a mighty shadow over them. We made it, Link said as soon as they crossed the bridge. He had to crane his head back to take in the temple's awesomeness. We made it to Snowhead. Yeah, we did, Tail said, almost sounding sad. Link didn't have time to read into his words. He turned to walk up the ramp that would lead them to the distant entrance. I'm almost there, Tattle. The first room Link entered was surprisingly small. Tail illuminated the dark walls, revealing a snowy line on the floor where the blizzard could no longer reach. Large, claw-like icicles shot up from the ground, curving over to surround a passageway on the other side. 
The doorway, however, was blocked by a heavy stone cube. The walls, ceilings, and floor were all the same shades of gray, white, and blue. The minimal increase of warmth was welcome, though the cave appeared to be entirely ice and rock. Temple number two, Link thought, shaking the eerie feeling that fell over him. Well, we're here, Tail said, looking back at the gray sky outside. Is there a plan? Search the temple, Link said as he crossed the room, for signs of Tattle, the re-dead thing, and a way to break the curse on Snowhead. He approached the stone block wedged firmly into the next doorway, shattering the icicles in his way with Darmani's fists. That thing is huge, Tail said, joining him at the roadblock. It's gonna take more than average strength to move this thing. Good thing I'm a dead Goron hero, Link said smugly, grabbing it firmly on both sides. He pushed, and the block slid inward. It continued gliding across the smooth floor as he stepped through the passageway. Eventually, the block fell once it reached a large hole in the ground, creating a doorstep into the next room. It was just as small, but there were two differences. First, there were three doors, one on each new wall. The one across from him was frozen over by a thick layer of ice, and the one to his left was wrapped in chains secured by a padlock. The last one was an open passageway. The second difference, however, was the white wolfos in the center. Its red eyes were bright as it pounced at the intruders. Link instinctively curled into a ball, rolling past the large white wolf as it missed. Its paws sliced through the thin air, though its nails still rang loudly with a deadly threat. Tail flew to the ceiling and avoided the battle, though the wolfos never cared for the smaller prey. It turned back to Link, who exited his ball to battle. The wolfos ran on all fours for a second attack, its bared fangs and savage snarl promising death. It leapt again, landing on top of Link and immediately piercing his Goron arms. It reached for his neck next, but Link grabbed the wolfos's neck to hold its snout back. It growled viciously, snapping for his throat as blood ran along Link's arms. The hero stumbled back into the wall, struggling to pull the monster off and protect his head. Eventually, he overpowered it, flinging the wolfos into the wall. Its red claws tore free as its back hit the chain door. The wolfos fell, stunned, and Link grabbed it by the neck before it could recover. He slammed the beast headfirst into the wall. The impact killed it. The wolfos slid down the wall into a pool of its own blood. Link backed away from the dead beast, examining his arms to see the deep cuts. They weren't severe, but they stung nonetheless. Link looked up to see Tail in shock. You killed it, the fairy said. <sighs> it, it tried to eat me, Link said, looking away from the battered body. It was just so brutal, Tail said eventually, struggling to find the right words. <sighs> I've never killed anything with my hands before, Link said, still facing away from his victim. The overwhelming tiredness suddenly returned, just like it had before entering the temple. I don't know how much longer I can keep going, he thought, but he couldn't stop until Tattle was back. Would it be safer to fight as a human then? Link looked back at Tail with heavy eyes. I thought about that. But this is the Goron Temple. The cold might be too much for me. Okay, Tail said uncertainly, turning to the only free door. I guess we'll go that way? Yep, Link said. Hopefully it's not a dead end. They stepped into a dark, cave-like passageway. It wound around in a large curve to the left and reminded them of the Skull Kid's cave. Link and Tail walked through nonetheless, feeling something unexpected. Heat. Tail's eyes widened when they found its source. I don't think you have to worry about freezing to death anymore. The next room was much larger than the previous two. It was narrow, and a small ledge ran until it reached a gap. A wooden bridge promised a way over it, but underneath, a very long descent eventually ended at a pool of bright red magma. Thankfully, it was far enough down to not overwhelm them, though falling would lead to certain death. 
the magma's heat traveled far, and Link hoped it could warm the rest of his journey without proving to be a problem. However, the problem presented itself almost immediately, a hole in the bridge. The entire middle portion was missing, and both of its ends stopped at a ramp implying another Goron jump would be necessary. This won't be fun, Link thought, wondering how sturdy the bridge even was to support a rolling Goron. Yup, Link said. No more freezing to death. I just have to worry about burning to death in a pit of magma instead. We could try one of those other doors, Tails said, looking back at the entrance. I don't think you're supposed to die in the temple. Supposed to? Link said, wrinkling his brow. What do you mean by that? I, uh... Tail gulped. I mean, what I said. You can't die here after everything you've worked for. Not here. What? Link thought. He decided he was too tired to think through Tail's odd word choice. Every ounce of mental capacity mattered going forward. One was chained shut, and the other was frozen over. We won't be able to get through. Okay, Tail said nervously. Just be careful. He flew over the bridge himself as Link closed his eyes, focusing. You can do this, he thought, ignoring the slight stumble that warned him of utter exhaustion. He backed away from the bridge, ensuring he was aligned with its center. He then rolled into a ball, allowing his sensory perception to sweep the room all the way down to the magma. He rolled as fast as he could. The sound of rock on rock changed once he reached the wood, though the creaking was severe. His great speed took him across before anything cracked. He hit the ramp, completely destroying it even as it sent him upward. He continued rolling until he landed on the bridge's opposite side and passed onto the next ledge's smooth safety. He quickly stood, turning in shock as the bridge debris rained into the magma. When his heartbeat finally slowed, he sighed. The adrenaline's tail end fell like a hammer over him. I feel like you always caught it really close, Tail said. It would be nice if I wasn't constantly fearing for your life. Link smiled, looking at the doorway leading onward. I'm never that lucky, Link said. Death is always just around the corner. Hopefully not this one, Tail said as they passed into the next room. While death was not what they found, the two were once again stunned into silence. It was a chamber that likely constituted the vast majority of the temple. It was cylindrical and ran up hundreds of feet. Ramps jutted from the walls to fill the empty space, continuing all the way to the top. There were several floors above and below, but Lynx seemed to be the only one with a solid floor connecting all sides. The higher levels had their doors and ramps separated by empty space, making crossing impossible without a Goron jump. A circular, ornate tower rose from the lower floors and ended right on Link's level, creating the only visible floor. It rested perfectly between all the ramps, promising at least a temporary break from rolling. Link looked between the gaps to try and see how far down the massive tower went, but it was impossible to tell. The faint glow of magma in the distance promised it was housed in hidden lava. The chamber was a labyrinth that was boggling to behold. The top was the brightest, a white hue illuminating the lower floors made of dark rock. Ice slowly seemed to replace stone the further one climbed. I have a really bad feeling I'm going to end up all the way up there, Link said. Yup, Tail agreed gloomily. One thing at a time, Link thought. There was a door to his left, which was iced over. He recognized it as the other side of the entrance's frozen door. The second was a door directly across from him, and the right side's curved wall had been replaced with iron bars. Inside lay a door, chains, shackles, and one or two skeletons. Don't want to know what that room was used for, Link decided. He continued through the next door with Tail. Room number four was much less impressive. Though it was still larger than the first two, it was much smaller than the main chamber. It was composed of several raised platforms leading up to a door on a higher wall. Link sighed when he realized the bridges connecting them had fallen apart. Nothing else in the room was remarkable. It was empty and frozen over otherwise. I don't think I'll be able to do this as a Goron, Link said, removing his mask. 
the muscles and scratches on his arms, his sideburns, his rock back, and his large stomach all vanished. He was once again a young, blonde-haired teen, donning winter pants and a jacket from the blacksmith. The weight of his bag, sword, and shield returned, and he noted the razor sword's increased weight. The Kokiri sword had been much lighter. Unexpectedly, his tiredness also increased tenfold, but the magma's heat thankfully reached even this room, stifling his shivers. Okay, Link said to reassure himself, climbing onto the first platform. I, I can do this. Tail watched skeptically. None of the platforms were high enough to result in a lethal fall, so the purple fairy watched with much less fear than before. Still, Link could see the judgment in his face. He thinks I can't do this, Link thought. He thinks I'm too tired to keep going. Link jumped from the first to the second without incident, but slipped when he stood on the third. He caught himself, however, making it up to the fifth and final one. He barely managed to pull himself onto the other side when his arms almost gave out. Link, Tail began worriedly. I'm fine, Link interrupted. We can't stop, he thought. We only have twenty-something hours before Tattle dies. If she isn't already dead. A voice in the back of his head said. It was the re-dead creature's voice mocking him from the recesses of memory. No, she isn't. She can't be. Let's just keep moving, Link said. The next room was another curvy cave similar to the first. He realized all the temple's rooms surrounded the large one in the center. The passages snaking up and down made it possible to change levels. He expected Goron jumping was the only way to cross floors. They found a hole in the right wall, overlooking the central chamber. The passageway continued past it, but Link stopped to peer out the window, which created a small alcove in the cave. He also noted ashes and charred wood on the floor here. Others have rested here, Link realized. Link? Tail said, as if reading his mind. You have to rest. No, Link said, turning to face the way onward again. Link. I shouldn't be this tired, he said stubbornly. I've been awake for longer than this plenty of times before without a problem. But this is different, Tail said. You haven't slept since the cave, the Skull Kid's evil cave, with all that dark magic and stuff. I'm not sure anyone's ever left that thing alive and you haven't rested since then. That magic can really affect you. I got to rest in your bag after the Skull Kid attacked me, but... We only have one day left. Link said, and the sun will rise in a few hours. We have to make sure we're ready when it does. Tail finished. Please, if you die, all of Termina does. Just rest for a few hours. Then we can finish what we started. Link's mind didn't have the energy to argue further. Maybe he's right. The hero stared distantly at a wall and nodded. Link wandered over to the wall across from the open window, sitting down with his back against it. Okay, Link said. Just for a bit. Yes, Tail said. I don't need a lot of sleep, so I'll wake you up when I do. Okay, he said, relaxing into a lying position. His head found the softest spot on the ground, using his green hat as a pillow. He faced the window looking out at the temple's beauty as his eyes grew heavier. He noticed Tail staring at him oddly. Here, Link said, taking his bag off and scooting it closer to the purple fairy. You can sleep on this, so you don't have to sleep on that rock. Tail took a moment to say anything, merely looking at the bag with an expression that was hard to read. Thanks, he said, uncertainly flying to rest on it. Link watched the fairy's pensive, concerned face. I'm sorry, the hero said, for how stubborn I can be. Your sister handled it better because she's more stubborn somehow, but that's not your fault. I'm glad you're here with me, so sorry if I seem unappreciative that you're sticking around. Tail didn't reply until the hero had closed his eyes and turned around. 
Thanks, Link. That means a lot. 16 hours earlier. It was the entrance to a cave, appearing perfectly circular. Tails stared into its darkness with the blonde-haired human gravely, though the cave's small opening didn't reveal anything. The wind howled behind them as the fairy and boy looked inside. Whatever twisted secret lay within that gaping maw was silent, but the fairy could feel its hunger. The snow still pummeled down on them relentlessly this far north, though Tail knew that would be preferable to whatever was inside there. If Tuttle's down there, Tail said, speaking over the storm, I don't think we can save her. We have to try, the boy said. But you don't even know that she is down there. Then don't come with me. Tail noticed the boy's hand go to the handle of his razor sword as he slowly slid it out of his sheath. He then stepped into the darkness, blade at the ready. Tail fluttered uneasily. The darkness seemed to suck the boy inward, further into its depths. What's in there? The purple fairy thought. As he watched the hero's blade, he swore blood now lined its edges, dripping onto the cave floor. What if that thing that kidnapped my sister is controlling him right now? What if it's a trap? What if his sword becomes bathed in my blood? No one would hear his screams. He would be alone. I'd die. For no reason. Because Tattle can't be in there. The boy turned back around, spotting Tail waiting at the cave's mouth. The purple fairy stared sadly at him, and then flew away. In all directions, it was the same no matter where he looked, a heavy storm blanketing everything except the tall mountain peak at his back. Being lost is better than being dead, Tail decided, refusing to turn around. The cave entrance was already obscured by the blizzard. Tail flew deep into the snowstorm, going forward in a straight line. If I don't change directions, I can't get lost. I'll end up somewhere safe. Opposite the cave was south, which would eventually bring him back to warmer regions. He flew for quite a while with no change in scenery. Just white. Everywhere. I should have followed the mountain wall back. But there was no fixing that now. He had to keep going forward. If he so much as stopped or looked around to see where he was going, he would be lost in the snow, wind, and ice. He saw a dark speck on the horizon. It was barely visible through the thick downpour. Tail paused, rather than eagerly fly toward the figure. It could be anybody. Looks like it's a human. Tail blinked, though, and then it was gone. The fairy froze. Where did it go? Tail spun around, looking through the blizzard for the stranger. Am I imagining things? This far up north, crazy things happened. It was probably a trick. Tail flew a few feet further, but he stopped when he heard something. Crunch. Crunch. It was the sound of booted feet walking in snow, but there was no one nearby. Tail spun around, but the sound stopped again. I realized as I heard it. Adrenaline seeped into the fairy's body as he spun around, frantically searching for the mysterious stranger. And then he realized he turned around, which was a death sentence. Dan? Tattle would be nagging right about now. You lost North, Tattle would say. Of course you did, because you're Tail and you can't do anything right. <sighs> Tail, the coward and the screw-up. Except his sister wasn't there to save him this time. The cold was already getting to him. He'd been in it with the boy for too long. Crunch. It was only one step, but it sounded deliberate and close. Tail froze. It's okay. It's nothing. It's either a trick or a small animal walking in the snow. But suddenly, he felt the shadow of someone behind him. Someone that was much taller. Someone who seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. Tail turned around. Instantly, the blood in his veins froze. His wings were suddenly impossible to control, trembling in agony. Every part of his body refused to obey, even his eyes. As if strings were attached to his limbs and had been pulled taut, he was forced to stare into the dark, endless pit. 
that were the Redead's eyes. Decaying. Cold. Lifeless. Only its face was revealed, all else concealed beneath gloves, a robe, and a hood. Tail would have screamed if he could have. But he couldn't. Even as he could not look away from its eyes, his peripheral vision noted its rotting cheeks and forehead. You need to go back into that cave. Its voice was clear, articulate, and commanding. It didn't have the characteristics that a mindless monster would, and its mouth never moved. Tail's lips trembled and he realized he'd regained control of his throat. The rest of his body remained captive. <laughs> What is this thing? I... I... It was clearly what had kidnapped Tattle, and now he was just as dead as his sister. You will go into that cave. There was no hesitation in its command. Uh, uh, why? Because the boy will die if you don't go in after him. The cave will kill him if he's alone. But... but won't I die? Tail's heart raced, and each swallow was tight and painful. I don't want to die, he thought. Please, don't kill me, please. Not when he realizes he holds the key to survival. He holds magic that can shatter its illusions. I don't... I can't... What, what if... Your mere presence will help him first, but you must hurry. He wasn't supposed to enter the cave, but there's nothing I can do to change that now. The cold was much sharper when he couldn't move his body. His limbs were outstretched, forcing him to embrace the winter chill. His mind scrambled to overcome the fear and understand what was happening. You want me to save him? Tail asked. You're not in a position to ask questions, the redead creature said. He needs to reach Snowhead Temple, and you will make sure he does. If he doesn't, I will kill you. If he goes after Tattle instead, I will kill you. If he dies, so will you. If you don't abandon him after he reaches Snowhead, then I will kill you. If you tell him you have spoken to me, if you warn him about anything I've said, if you give him the slightest hint, then I will kill you, and I can find you no matter where you go. Then, Tail heard a scream. It was shrill, but muffled, as if restrained. He couldn't make out all the words, but he realized with horror that the voice was coming from within the creature's robes. Tattle! He realized in horror. I will rip off each of your limbs, one by one, but I will make you twist them off your body. Tears filled Tail's eyes with each word, and between the terror and the pain, he tried to concentrate on his sister's screaming. Her voice was barely loud enough to make it through her prison. Next, you'll find the veins in your eyes filling with too much blood until they burst. But that's only the beginning. Your limbless, blind body will still be alive, and I will make its last moments more excruciating than it was to render you into a flightless pulp of blood. And I will take my time doing it. She was screaming his name, trying to get him to listen. Now. You will enter the cave. You will make sure the boy gets out alive. And you will make sure he goes to Snowhead before anywhere else. He will free the giant, play the Song of Time, and watch all of his efforts reset. The creature with the re-dead face reached into its cloak without looking away from Tail. Then, his sister was silent. Tail watched as the creature's gloved hand returned, as if it had done something... unspeakable. Tail barely managed to speak. 
What are you going to do with my sister? There was no reaction. The face was as stiff as it was decaying. Seconds passed, but still, it refused to say a word. Can't, can't you let me and my sister go? He now spoke while openly weeping. Please, we'll do anything. We'll make the boy do whatever you want, or I will... And then we'll leave and never come back or say anything. I promise you can have whatever you want. Just please let us go. The re-dead creature took a moment longer to respond. There is no reason for you or your sister to die. As long as you do what I ask, you and your sister will survive. Tail tried to nod, but his neck would still not move. You will make sure he goes to Snowhead, and then you will wound him by leaving him behind. He will continue to save the Gorons. Then he will play his song, abandon his fairy, and realize that everything he did was in vain. You and your sister will not return to the first day with him. You will wait until the moon has fallen, and if your sister is intelligent enough to fly above the explosion, you will find her. Tail didn't say anything. His tears stopped. Underneath his overwhelming fear was the slightest hope. As long as you oversee the boy's passage to Snowhead and betray him, then I will not hunt you down. The re-dead creature said. Don't think for even a moment that there's an alternative. Remember how powerless you feel right now. You are always under my control no matter where you are. Suddenly, Tail's limbs relaxed. Immense pain and exhaustion filled his muscles, but he was no longer held in place by its magical grip. The re-dead creature had turned away. The hooded being walked into the distance, its booted footsteps audible in the snow. Crunch. Crunch. Tail could only stare after it and watch. Eventually, the creature stopped walking and then it completely vanished. The only trace it left behind was its footsteps. Tail barely had the strength to keep flying. He shivered, looking up to see the snow had lightened. He could see the mountain again that housed the cave. Somewhere along the line, he'd gotten mixed up and had been heading back the way he'd come. The purple fairy flew toward the cave, completely dazed. He stopped himself when he almost passed out. His head felt so light. Focus, he told himself. If that boy sees you like this, he'll know something's wrong. You have to do this. For Tattle. He wiped the tears away as he returned to the cave. I don't even know his name, Tail realized. But I don't have a choice. This is the only way Tattle and I get to live. The present. Tail awoke on Link's bag. The boy remained curled into a ball against the wall, his eyes were closed, breathing in and out deeply as he got his much-needed rest. Tail rose slowly and silently, ignoring the tears that threatened to come. He looked out the window overlooking the central chamber. I could change my mind, Tail thought. I could try to fight that monster, now that I have help. Tail could wake the hero up and tell him everything. Just maybe they had a fighting chance. But then he remembered that magical grip controlling every muscle in his body. I'm sorry, Link. Tail whispered. But I'm trying to save Daddle too. He flew away, leaving the boy behind.